Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Slip Safety Show. My name's Christian Harris, and as well as being your host, I am the founder of Slip Safety Services. This show exists to provide insight and value to people like me and you who are interested in the world being a safer, cleaner and more hygienic place. And my guest today is on that mission in the USA. His name's Russ Kenzior, and uh, as well as acting as a consultant and an expert witness in matters of slips, trips and falls, uh, he also set up the National Floor Safety Institute, which is a kind of a governing body in the US, similar to the UK Slip Resistance Group, uh, which I'm a member of here in the UK. Um, I'll let Russ describe it in his own words and give us uh, some, some of his background. I wanted to get Russ on the show because I thought it'd be really interesting to compare and contrast the situation in the US versus here in the UK. And we touched a little bit on Ireland as well, uh, but primarily US versus UK. There's this kind of perception that uh, America is very litigious and that some of the court um, amounts awarded are ridiculous. And so we get into a bit of that. We talk about testing and, uh, and a few other bits and bobs too. Uh, Russ uh, very kindly has also invited me onto his podcast, which is called The Slip and Fall Guy. So that will be coming out, I think, later in uh, 2020 as well. If you found this useful, uh, we'd love it if you could uh, pass uh, other people our way, give us some recommendations to friends and colleagues. And of course, if you can subscribe as well, that would be fantastic and uh, would give you the benefit of knowing when episodes are being released as well. So with that, let's get into my conversation with Russ Kenzior from the US of A and the National Floor Safety Institute. Russ Kenzior, welcome to the Slip Safety Show. Yo, Chris. Uh, do you want to start by giving uh, the audience a bit of a background about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Russ Kenzior. I'm the founder of the National Floor Safety Institute, and uh, we were founded back in 1997 as a 501c3 charitable organization uh, with a real simple mission, that is to aid in the prevention of slips, trips, and falls through education, research, and standards development. So for the last 23 years, we've been the leading organization here in North America. Um, that, that really addresses the subject matter directly of slip, trip, and fall prevention. Um, prior to the NFSI, there was, um, you know, there were other organizations that were focused on slip and fall prevention, uh, but not really uh, as specifically as, as we've done. We've really kind of taken on the challenge in North America to conquer this, uh, yeah. this growing epidemic, this problem. Fantastic. And it's, and the group is, is made up of all sorts of different organizations. It's like a membership uh, body, if I, if I've understood it correctly. That's correct. We are, um, a membership organization. We're a 501c3 charitable organization. So we're a non-for-profit and, um, that's really where our revenue is generated through memberships. Uh, we also have, um, uh, three different, if you will, um, funnels um, of, of generating revenue. Of course, memberships is one. We test and certify products. We independently test and certify uh, products for manufacturers across, really across the world. We have products all over the, the world that we, uh, we test um, yeah. per the NFSI standards. And then um, we also have a, a training uh, arm. We do a lot of classroom training, uh, soon to be online training uh, on the subject of slip, trip, and fall prevention. So we're, we're pretty much up to, uh, uh, in this subject, up to our necks, so to speak. Yeah, it sounds good. And I mean, there's a body uh, here called the UK Slip Resistance Group, which I'm a member of, um, but we're much less advanced in terms of, I think, working in, a, in a, such an expansive way uh, as you guys. So it's interesting to hear what, uh, what's happening over the pond. And how did you get involved in this, uh, this field? Is there an interesting story behind that? Well, my background was actually somewhat similar to yours, um, just separated by about 30 years. In 1990, I founded a um, company called Traction Plus. And Traction Plus 
developed a cleaning agent, a safety agent uh, for floors. There was an acid-based micro etching. Yeah. Do-it-yourself product that was used and is still being used um, by companies to safety treat their floors to mm-hmm. make them make them so they would not have a uh, present a hazard uh, under wet conditions. So it was a very um, slow growing product category uh, back in the early 90s. And about somewhere in the early to mid 90s, it started to take off. We expanded distribution throughout all of North America. In fact, we were distributed in Europe, in Belfast. We had a distributor in Belfast. Okay. Hmm. So uh, the product took off. We expanded the line to have um, um, a product for floor finishes, like waxes, I guess people would call yeah. it. That was also a Traction Plus product that was patented. Uh, we partnered with Walmart stores uh, to develop one of the first lines of slip resistant footwear called Traction Plus Tread Safe Shoes. Um, that's Tread Safe brand is still currently available from Walmart stores, uh, US and Canada. Um, maybe even globally, I'm not certain. Yeah, um, maybe. Develop the wet floor sign that kind of pops open like a tent. You've probably yeah. seen them, the three sided. We, in fact, we called them safety tents. They were called safety tents. And uh, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, it worked out really well. Uh, long story short, I, I, I'm a guy that invented or developed a lot of products, engineered a lot of solutions uh, to preventing slips and falls. And then in, in 1997, I founded the Traction Plus. Floor Safety Institute, uh, which of course spun off to become its own entity, the National Floor Safety Institute. Yeah. So um, that's kind of the the evolution. Yeah. Uh, back when I started Traction Plus, there were companies that were coming out and etching floors. That was not a new idea. Bringing acid out and putting it on the floor. What made our product different? It was um, safe. Uh, do it yourself, and so a store owner could bring in the chemical through their distribution center and safety treat their floors uh, whenever they needed to. So it was just kind of a different approach to to bringing safety into the cleaning industry. In fact, today, the International Sanitary Supply Association, uh, which is a founding member, I think, of the National Floor Safety Institute, will say um, that, that the NFSI and myself have elevated floor care to floor safety. Today, most cleaning products that are being developed in the U.S. are focused on, at least in part, on safety. And that's reflected in the number of products that have been tested and certified by the NFSI mm. for safety. That's interesting because that, um, that doesn't seem to be happening here yet. I think, um, and we'll get onto this maybe a bit later, but I think we're perhaps ahead of you guys in some respects. And it sounds like behind you in, in that respect, because there's still a lot of you know, uh, pine gel um, products and things like that that leave lots of residues oh, yeah. that, that make floors slippery co- coming out left, right and center oh, over and, here. And we still have those here too, Chris. Mm. Don't get me wrong. We still have, we still have the, the pine oil based products yeah. and others, but um, they're slowly f- kind of uh, being phased out or re-engineered, uh, the chemicals being re-engineered. So they reflect some level of, yeah. Of, safety performance. And by the way, we have a standard that was just published this past January. It's uh, NFSI B101.2, and it's specifically for floor cleaners. Okay. It's a floor cleaner standard. Hmm. So, um, you know, if you want to know if your floor cleaner leaves a slippery residue or not, you can now test it or, or send it out to a laboratory to have the, the, the slippery yeah. film, if it deposits one, um, yeah. tested. No, that's uh, that's very helpful because that that to me, I mean, I think, you know, of course, in lots of cases, floors are inherently slippery, irrespective of how you um, clean and maintain them. But I think the majority of cases where, certainly in my experience, I've seen slips and falls happening over the years are where the floors themselves are pretty good or even very good, but they're just not being maintained right. very well. And then you get this kind of layer of, of, of residue on, on the surface and then the foot touches that not the floor. And then that's when you slip. Well, and I, and you bring up a good point. The shoe is the other half of the equation. You can make the floors perfectly safe. Hmm. Um, Based on our research, uh, 50% of all slips and falls is directly a result of an unsafe floor, whether it be a wet floor, a hazardous floor, the floor is creating the hazard. That's Hmm. half of the problem. So that means the other half is yet to be solved. That includes things like footwear. In fact, 20, 
3% um, of all slips and falls are uh, directly caused by shoes. Um, and the most dangerous of all shoes, Chris, is the flip-flop. Yeah. And um, a very commonly worn shoe. Um, probably around the world, it's the most common type of footwear. And flip-flops, you know, when, um, when wet are little surfboards on your yep. feet. Yep. And you can't always tell people what types of shoes they can wear, especially if you're a business owner. If you're a business owner, yep. people come in with all kinds of shoes or no shoes for that sometimes. So you can't control the shoe, but you can control your floor. And that's what we encourage businesses to do is take control of their floors and to understand that people will wear all kinds of shoes and, and be preoccupied. They'll be texting and they'll be yeah, of course, doing yeah. things that people do. So you can't prevent all the other no. causes. But if you can get a handle on the, the biggest piece of the pie, which is the floor, um, yeah. that'll have the biggest impact. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's kind of the message that we're putting out there as well. You know, we, we're looking at all of the factors, but um, it's, it's what's controllable for you. So if you're right. um, operating a restaurant, then footwear is a great control measure for your staff, but obviously for members of the public and your, your customers, you can't control their footwear. So you need to think about the other, the other things in the floor primarily. But in, but back to your first question, it's not all that um, sexy of a subject no. um, to talk about. A lot of people, a lot of companies just buy whatever the least expensive cleaning products yeah. they can get at the big yeah. box retailers or through their distributors. They're not necessarily thinking in terms of safety until, until somebody gets hurt. Yeah. And um, great question I would offer you to ask your, your clients, your prospective clients is, and it's a simple kind of mundane question of, do you have a slip and fall issue? Do you have a slip and fall problem? And most of the time, they'll look at you and say, well, of course. That's why we have insurance. Oh, that's interesting because I find um, if I ask that question in a, in a fairly direct manner, people will say no um, because I think they put their sort of defences up. Um, and it's only when you can start to <clears throat> run through with them, actually, well, when you say you don't have a big issue, you know, what does that really mean? Because one slip every five years clearly is very different to two or three slips a month and actually people will often think two or three slips a month isn't that big an issue but if you look at it statistically <clears throat> certainly in the uk you know the average building has many many fewer slips than one per year so if you're having you know even one per year you're well above average and therefore actually you do have a problem but there's a, a perception issue there that they, they kind of don't think that a few accidents is a problem. Right. Right. Well, and again, it's not as in many cases, it's a subjective question. Mm -hmm. um, we have a um, lot of lawsuits here in the United States and oftentimes I'll be retained as an expert witness in these types of lawsuits from my private company, which is called traction experts. That's my consulting arm. Um, I don't do any expert witness work through the, National Floor Safety Institute, um, okay. which I actually volunteer for. Uh, I'm not a paid employee okay. of the NFSI. I'm, in fact, it costs me money. I'm, I'm one of the people that funds the NFSI. Um, but in my work as an expert witness, I'll come across statistics or evidence. And it wouldn't be unusual for um, a large grocery store chain to have tens of thousands mm -hmm. of slip and fall claims, actually actual injury claims yeah. over a five-year period. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't consider that a problem. That's kind of business as usual. And again, the mentality here is a different than in your country because the way our companies' businesses are insured is differently. And so insurance companies here um, will sadly have to pick up the bill, the tab mm -hmm. for these, um, these costs. And so a property owner, when you think about it, why should they care? I mean, yeah, they're, yeah. Not, they're not really paying for it. Their insurance mm. company is. Yeah. Although that is a bit of a short sighted view because they are, they will pay for it. Um, the next time they need to buy insurance because obviously if they keep having accidents, their premium is going to be going to be rising. You know what? You would think that that would be a trigger. In mm. fact, I don't think it really is. Um, and let me give you a good example. If um, the cost of, you know, electricity goes up, if the cost of, you know, of, food or products in general go up um, for a particular business. They simply pass that cost along to the consumer. You pay a little bit more 
right? Mm -hmm. And the products and services you're buying because the supplier's costs have gone up. Same is, is true here. If your insurance goes up because you've had a lot of slips and falls, you simply mm -hmm. just pass that cost along to your mm -hmm. customer. And, um, you know, so for every time you buy a, you know, a hamburger at your favorite hamburger store, uh, you know, 10 cents of that goes towards paying a slip and fall claim. Yeah. And you're none the better for knowing it. And no. again, that, that, that's the tradition. Realistically, Chris, that is the business model. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is how falls in the United States are perceived as yeah. just a cost of doing cost business. Of business. Now, yeah. mm -hmm. lawsuits actually help. <laughs> yeah solve the problem mm -hmm. because when a big co company gets sued and has to pay a lot of money in a, in a, in a lawsuit or a settlement in, or has a lot of lawsuits and settlements, um, that's when the, the pressure is turned up um, by the insurance company who will say, we're not going to insure you anymore. You're going to go uninsured. Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's the kiss of death. Mm -hmm. And so there actually is some benefit. And I know it's, Hard to understand, but you know, people around the world consider America as crazy. I mean, you crazy Americans with your lawsuits. Um, but the lawsuit actually does make a, a, a big difference in mm. getting the attention of a company that would otherwise not really care. Yeah. Just yeah. Kind of pass the cost along to the customer mm. and, you know, whatever. And it's interesting that that's come up in just through us talking because actually it was the first question I was going to ask was, was about lawsuits because I think the perception. <laughs> Uh, here, as you said, is, you know, there's a lot of, it's a very litigious um, country and you hear occasionally about these very large awards of, you know, millions and millions of dollars for uh, slip and fall or trip and fall accidents. But I mean, is that, is that the reality or is that just that there are a few of those, but, but, but more often than not, actually these claims are being settled for, for very small amounts. That's correct. Um, you know, we, we tend to sensationalize through the media a lot of a lot of this subject matter most people when they fall do not first of all get hurt seriously um, of those that do fall and get hurt seriously will um, file a, a report with the property owner the business owner or the or their employer if it's a workplace injury they'll file what's called a claim and they'll make a claim and and most of the time a company will just work with the, the individual to uh to settle the claim. If the claim isn't settled, then it goes to a lawsuit. That's the sizable injury. We're, most people, by the way, Chris, most people um, that file lawsuits don't want to file a lawsuit. They're, they've yeah. never filed a lawsuit. They're, they're very yeah. uh, adverse to suing, but they have very, very large, usually medical bills. And mm. so if you have medical expenses um, that are over $100,000 and not being paid by your insurance company, see, it's the healthcare side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because obviously you do have a very a different healthcare system to to us, where we've got universal healthcare, and and um, so a lot of this this stuff would be dealt with on our NHS, and, and therefore there wouldn't necessarily be um, the cost associated with that. Um, which yeah, well, we have universal healthcare, universal yeah. access. It's just not paid by the government. Yeah. Uh, we pay for it separately, so people buy their insurance on the marketplace. And um, we have, as you know, probably some of the best medical care in the world, um, but it's not free, it's expensive. Yeah. And so uh, say, I, I, for example, I got retained in a lawsuit just a few weeks ago where a 60 year old woman was shopping at a, a large retail store and you see it on surveillance video and she slips and falls on a spill and breaks her hip. Well, when you back out of the cost um, of that hip and she's not old enough to be on Medicare, meaning, Social Security, where they would offset the cost of that hip mm. uh, fracture, and um, but she's not young, and so it's still a life-altering um, effect on her life. So yeah. she's sixty; she breaks her hip. That's going to run her without complications fifty, sixty thousand dollars. You look mm. at the fact she is may not be able to return to work. You just add it up; it's easily a hundred thousand yeah. dollars now. Hmm. she's saying, well, well, wait a minute. It wasn't my fault. There was a, you know, a hazard on the floor. I didn't see it. I stepped on it and you see it. It's all captured on surveillance video. Um, hmm. So what do you do now? Yeah. The retailer doesn't want to pay her anything. No. They don't want to give her a dime. They told her to go away. Hmm. Um, and, th and that's also very common. Um, I don't think I've ever really worked on a lawsuit where, where a plaintiff went to a defendant and, and asked for a sum of money just to cover their costs of medical treatment, et cetera. And the retailer 
um, to say, yeah, okay. I mean, it, that's never happened. It's mm. always prompts a lawsuit. And so yeah. she has to sue just to recover her costs for her injury. Yeah. It, it's, it's not what the media makes it out to be. These are not people no. living, you know, a great, this isn't lifestyles of the rich and famous. No. I mean, no. In fact, most slip and fall lawsuits um, don't result in, in much of, of any real payment. In fact, it's a very difficult type of lawsuit to pursue. Many attorneys right. won't handle or even take. Hmm. a slip and fall lawsuit. But occasionally there are some that are in the millions of dollars. Uh, that's true. Most of the time that's because of what's called punitive damages. If a yeah. uh, particular defendant has had a history of people getting hurt and never really made an effort to correct the problem, the jury gets mad hmm. and says, you know, we're going to send a message to you, yeah. you know, that you're not looking out for public safety. So they'll award the plaintiff um, a large sum of money. I had another case um, last year where a gentleman, older, elderly gentleman, slipped or I'm sorry, tripped over a pallet. Yeah, you know, pallets that they use for shipping merchandise. This is in a retail store, and I don't know if they use pallets as displays in the UK, but they do here, where they'll have a pallet on the floor of a Sometimes, grocery yeah. store, and this one had watermelons in it. And this elderly gentleman walked up to the pallet, grabbed the watermelon unbeknownst to him, his, the toe of his boot got stuck in between the two slats of the pallet. So when he went to turn, his foot mm. got stuck and he fell yeah. and fractured his elbow. Yeah. Pretty serious injury. Um, long story short, this was a repeat offender. This, defend, this defendant, this grocery store was a frequent flyer, so to speak, in, yeah. in the courthouse. And the jury awarded him $19 million, wow. of which 13 13 million dollars was, was punitive mm -hmm. damages. Yeah. They wanted yeah. to send a message. Now, oftentimes that gets overturned by a superior court yeah. and the numbers yeah. are reduced, but the message is the same, you know, yeah. take better control and better care of your, your business to prevent people from getting hurt. Yeah. Yeah. See, we don't have that here. The, 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 um, the civil claim, which is how, what a personal injury claim would come under. There's no such thing as, as um, punitive damages. It's the, 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 the theory of it basically is that the claimant, if they're, found to be um, correct should be restored back to the point at which they were before the accident. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, um, I've done a personal injury claim myself. I was um, standing on the, the pavement or the sidewalk, as you, you'd call it, and a car kind of lost control and mounted the curb and, 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 and ran me over, basically. So I broke my wrist and my collarbone and various other things. Um, and I obviously pursued a claim uh, for that. But the the amount of money I got was not a small amount of money, um, but it certainly wasn't enough that I felt like I was glad that the thing had happened because right. the principle of- the Hey, law you want to do it again, right, Chris? <laughs> you want to go and do another one, right? See, that's how the, the media makes it out to be like, oh yeah, these are scammers. They're just cashing in. Mm -hmm. um, most people that file claims, most are legit. I mean, they're real people yeah. really got hurt. Yeah. Um, our statistics show that for a traditional slip and fall, uh, only about 3% are considered fraudulent. Uh, yeah. When you get trips and falls in there, that mm -hmm. number tends to go up because it's a little bit harder to fake a trip and fall um, without getting hurt. Um, it's easy just to kind of sit down on the ground and say, look, yeah. I slipped. But yeah. when you trip, that, mm -hmm. that usually can, be, can result in, in some injuries. But, um, but the thing that's interesting, and you touched upon it, is the different approaches, your approach, the, the um, approach that Europe has taken in prevention of slips and falls is not based on litigation costs or the threat of lawsuits. Um, you have more governmental control. You mix government into um, health care. Uh, they maintain and control health, the health care in your country. And they also maintain uh, the insurance side, if you will. Mm -hmm. So it's all one entity here. It's separated. Here you buy your health care separately, you buy your insurance separately, and it's a choice. Yeah. Um, but with that has created difficulty in, in developing solutions. For mm -hmm. us, manufacturers um, of floors, for example, do not uh, applaud floor safety initiatives. Uh, right. They see it as potential exposure to liability. So manufacturers mm -hmm. of floors, for example, will generally... Um, talk about floor safety and, and, and demonstrate an interest and attend all the meetings, um, but not really do anything about it. Um, and yeah. The reason being is, in my opinion, 
um, liability. So if you're a manufacturer of flooring and you test your products and one day somebody falls, uh, they go into the field, they test your product and found that it is um, uh, of different results than you have had in your lab for whatever reason, they yeah. were lower. Um, they consider that liability. And, it, and I guess in a sense it is uh, yeah. a form of liability. So I understand where they're coming from. But on the big picture, if the goal is to prevent lawsuits, all right, that's kind of their concern. We don't want to be sued. We, we don't care if you get sued. Yeah. We just don't want to be brought into your lawsuit. Yeah. In other words, their customers get sued all the time. They don't mm. seem to mind. Yeah. yeah, It's just don't drag us into it. So the minute they start talking about safety standards, slip and fall prevention uh, initiatives, that can be measured. Um, they're now throwing in, as we like to say, in, in, into your problem. They now become part of the food chain. So they want to keep their distance um, from the subject matter. And I under, again, I, I understand where they're coming from. That's mm. their business model. Yeah. But again, if the goal is prevention of slips and falls, which is my goal and your goal, mm. then the fall that never happened um, is one that will never submit a claim. There will never yeah. be any medical costs and there'll never be a lawsuit. So if you prevent the fall at the be beginning, everything else kind of takes care of itself. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. But sadly, that's, um, that's not a real common uh, goal mm. that a lot of uh, manufacturers in the United States and frankly across the world share. Mm. Um, and, yeah, and there's, there's certainly a lot of debates, as I know you're aware, of, about the kind of can we harmonize slip resistance standards across the world and, and certainly different countries, um, some of the Mediterranean countries, for example, their standards committees are very much controlled by you know the manufacturers of say marble flooring who want to be selling nice shiny marble flooring which we all know in the real world uh, when it gets wet it's going to pose a hazard but they want that to be able to pass some sort of test whereas you know other countries um, take a more scientific approach and you know it's very very difficult to get um, agreement it seems to be. No you're right and, and <clears throat> again here I am defending the manufacturers who generally don't like me. <laughs> they don't really support the National Floor Safety Institute's right. uh, goals. But, um, but again, they're coming from a different, a different you know, perspective. They want to sell floors. Yeah. And, and they know many of the floors that they sell do present a risk. Um, but to give you a little you know, touch of, of some of the work we do, several years ago, we went to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the government regulatory agency here in the United States that handles uh, consumer product safety, obviously. And we asked them to do something very simple. We said, look, there's a growing number of people be being harmed by falls, specifically slips and falls, uh, some of which, many of which are in the home. In fact, statistically, most people that are injured uh, as a result of a slip and fall will be injured in their home, yeah. much like the rest of the world. And so we approached the federal government here in the United States with a simple, uh, we thought, petition. And that was to mandate that manufacturers of flooring products um, test their products to the then ANSI NFSI B101.3. That's the wet dynamics coefficient of friction standard, um, which is now simply called NFSI B101.3. Right. And, uh, and, and test their product and then label the product um, with the... Uh, B101.5 product labeling standard. It looks like, looks like a gas gauge. It has a little arrow that points to, you know, low traction, kind of, yeah. you know, if you can imagine, empty on one side yeah, of the yeah. gas gauge and full. So it would point to one of three zones, low, moderate, or high traction. And so the manufacturers would test their, well, let's use your example, marble, marble floor. Mm -hmm. They identify the, the floor as having a, a low level of traction when wet which is probably exactly what it would be. And then they would simply put a label on the product saying this is a low traction product. So yeah. if you want to use it because you love the look of it, buy it. But understand this is critically important that you maintain it in a dry condition at all state at all times. Well, 100%, Chris, of the manufacturers of floor coverings in the world openly opposed it, wrote letters to the federal government saying, no, 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 don't do yeah. that. Um, and they all had their, you know, their, their versions of why they didn't like it. But at the end of the day, they don't want to test. They don't want the consumer mm. to know. 
And we felt it would be important for the consumer to know. And sadly, our petition um, uh, fell short of of getting um, majority support. It was a two to three vote. Very close. One person made a difference. Um, And we'll be back. Mm. Well, we'll be back. We'll be back. See, here in the United States, the um, commissions are, are, members of these committees are appointed by um, the White House, the president. Right. And so when you have um, a very conservative group of people who are uh, the majority, they, they are reluctant yeah. to embrace. To change, um, yeah. Yeah, they're, right. they're not bad people. They don't right. mean to do anything. But, but their view is, you know, we have too many laws, too many regulations now. We don't need another one. Yeah. Where people on the other side of the aisle tend to think we never have enough. Yeah. Or they, they just, they view the, the problem as being one that government should and can impact, hmm. okay? Where the other side of the aisle tends to see government as being, you know, stay out of the, stay out of, um, you know, the process. Don't yeah. get involved yeah. in regulating companies or businesses. So, yeah. um, but it's just a matter of waiting to see when that committee um, will change over in terms of its membership and yeah. we'll come back. It was a simple idea. It was not mm-hmm. a complex idea. No, I mean, and, it's, but it, it, it did reveal that did re, mm-hmm. it did reveal Chris that the manufacturers of floors flooring, and this was across the world, mm-hmm. openly oppose We're floor okay, safety yeah. standards. Mm-hmm. So when I say manufacturers oppose floor safety standards, it's not just Russ Ken's yours opinion. But, yeah. They said that in writing to the federal mm-hmm. government. Yeah. That, and again, various reasons why, but at the end of the day, they're not embracing floor safety right. issues. Yeah, I mean, we're, we, we, uh, there's another interesting um, comparison for here. So we have quite strict guidance. You know, we have to use the pendulum test, anything commercial. Um, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's 100% clear because there's always room for interpretation around how likely is a floor to get wet or not and what other control measures are there. But at least we know that you know, it's a pendulum test and you have to meet a certain standard. Whereas in the consumer side of the marketplace, uh, that doesn't really exist. But we have seen, um, there's a company here called um, Tops Tiles, which is probably the biggest tile retailer in the country. And they are now in their showrooms, uh, because I was in one recently, having a look, um, putting uh, slip resistance values on some of their products. You know, the ones that they're saying are for outside use or things like that they are they are starting to put some there which they don't have to do legally but i guess they've decided that that's uh, a sensible thing to do now there is a company i think they're based in the uk called uh, eltro yeah eltro forms they specifically manufacture safety flooring yeah um obviously they would not be opposed to floor safety standards no. but that's just one manufacturer that i'm aware of um th- there may be others that are producing some type of, um, of floors that are specifically um, uh, promoted for safety. Um, but most floors are not. And again, if you get back to the root of the, the causation, and that's what we like to focus on at, at NFSI, is what's causing um, the problem. And it's the floor. The floor represents the single biggest cause. And so if you want to kind of take on the single biggest cause, um, that means you start testing and standardizing. Well, the minute you start standardizing and, and uh, expanding, um, if you will, knowledge about the science of slips and falls, specifically as relates to coefficient of friction. And we test both ways, Chris. Mm-hmm. We have a, a dynamic standard. Uh, in fact, NFSI was the first organization in the United States to author a dynamic coefficient of friction standard, DCOF. Yeah. We historically have tested SCOF, static coefficient of friction and still have a standard that that permits the measuring of uh, standard of static coefficient of friction mm. um, we see it as two sides of the same coin measuring yeah. SCOF and DCOF they're both valuable they both bring insight um, as far as prevention goes but if you're not testing um, and a lot of a lot of businesses a lot of retailers for example grocery stores most will not test I don't know right. if that's the same way in the UK but yeah I the think only it, I time think in my experience Really? I mean, the only time in my experience that you'll have a, a major retail account um, test their floor is when they're being sued and somebody will come in because of a part of the lawsuit yeah. and start testing their floors. Uh, um, but they won't do it proactively. And mm. 
we're, that, that's our biggest challenge is to try to get retailers to begin to embrace the concept of, of testing uh, so they know. I use the analogy of, um, and you know, we're common for men to not want to go to the doctor as much as yeah. women. And, you know, you'll say, well, you know, I'm having chest pain and that's okay. It's just indigestion. Well, why don't you go to the doctor? Your mm-hmm. wife will ask. Um, and you say, oh, no, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. See, most guys don't want to go because they're afraid they're going to find out something's not good. Yeah. So yeah, by the way, you've got a heart blockage. Yeah. Um, well, I don't want to know that because <laughs> I don't have time to deal with a heart blockage. So yeah. what will happen is the denial of the problem leads to a bigger problem and ultimately death. Well, the same is true for slips and falls. Denying is a large retailer that you have a, a serious problem by not wanting to go to the doctor and have your floors tested to identify, is that what's causing your problem? Mm. Just brings upon bigger problems yeah i mean um, I, I think that's true here as well i think i think one of the one of the challenges is that um there's this kind of pandora's box uh, as you say issue if they start testing you know one of the big supermarket um or retail chains if they start testing and they and they they kind of have the same floor acres and acres of it throughout the country in thousands of stores and they find that it's slippery when wet they then kind of think oh well that's too big a problem to solve and they sort mm-hmm. of just bury their heads in the sand and, and, and sort of revert back to, well, it's the cost of doing business. Whereas actually, you know, what we would suggest that, that people like that should do is, is not think about the acres and acres of floor, because probably 95 or more percent of, of their floor areas are very unlikely to get wet anyway. But they should be taking a zonal approach and thinking about the entrances and the washrooms and the cafes and doing something there, which doesn't necessarily mean replacing the floor but it might mean cleaning it differently or doing something you know a bit unique well and here we are uh in the world of the coronavirus and in the state of texas uh since the beginning of the outbreak and here we are in what april the third uh we've had a grand total of 70 people die as a result of the coronavirus now statistically speaking that's an insignificant number and I'm not picking on the people who have died. Obviously, it's very That's serious. Cool. Yeah, but to give you some background, we have 29 million hmm. Texans, 29 million, 70 have died. In um, just within the last 24 hours, 75 people have died as a result of a slip and fall in the United States. So we will lose 75 people a day hmm. due to a fall. Yeah. And I consider that, that doesn't even make the news. Nobody even cares no. about it. Hmm. I mean, falls in the United States are like the fifth leading cause of accidental death. Yeah. Uh, it's the leading cause of accidental injury for almost every industry. I mean, it's just so pervasive. We, we, it costs our country hundred, well over a hundred billion dollars a year and many, many people's lives. And remember, most people don't die as a result of a slip and fall, but they get seriously injured. It's the leading cause of nursing home admissions. We yeah. can go on, you know, down the list. It's, you know, the leading cause of uh, emergency room visits, 8 yeah, million people hand. a year. Yeah. So you, you scale the problem and you say, well, how many people are dying of coronavirus? How many people are being infected? And I'm not minimizing that. I just right. want to, I want your audience to understand that th- when you compare statistically the problem of coronavirus, which the whole world is petrified of today, e- everybody's locked down. And mm-hmm. you compare that to falls, which statistically, at least in the United States, rep- represents a chronic condition, meaning every year we lose 30,000 people, yeah. but it, there's absolutely no publicity. There's no movement. There's no requirements. There's no testing. There's no labeling. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is, are those people's lives that were lost as a result of a fall somehow, somehow less important, less valuable than the people who will die of coronavirus? Both are, are innocent. I mean, yeah. they had nothing, there was nothing they could have done per se. Okay. But yeah, and it's, a it's, very, important it's a very interesting point. It's, it's something I'm always trying to, to get across some of this context and statistics and, um, you know, you're absolutely spot on in what you're saying. Um, and it's, but it's something that, uh, I guess people probably don't want to hear right now, even though it's, it's true, but it's actually just trying to, uh, to get the real information out there and the statistics and, and, and let people understand what a, just, sure. just what a big problem this is because and, yeah there's millions of millions of right. people uh, their lives are being changed I mean, and everybody's 
every, every life is valuable. Mm. Let me just be clear. Every life is, is precious. And especially if it's a loved one who dies yeah. of coronavirus or a fall or any other causation. But if we want to tackle the problem, like right now, the world is mobilized on developing vaccines and test methods and cures and whatever terminology you want to use. The medical community in the world globally is mobilized to get ahead of the coronavirus for this fall, meaning preventative. Yeah. And, and I applaud that. I just wish that approach would be taken yeah. to address a much more chronic problem that reflects, at least in our country, a greater uh, risk in terms of fat fatalities and certainly a greater risk in terms of injuries. For example, yeah. if somebody gets the coronavirus, just to give you another comparison, and, and they say most people that get coronavirus simply don't even know they had it. Mm. They, they get over it. It doesn't result in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a death. And there's no lingering consequences, at least based on what research is showing today. So if you get coronavirus, chances are you're not going to die. Mm -hmm. You're going to get sick for whatever time period, and you're going to be fine. Now, fine. let's say you go into a grocery store in London, and you slip and fall, and you break your hip. Well, maybe, hopefully, you won't die. But that, that injury is going to be with you the rest of your life. Yeah. It's a chronic injury. And there's costs associated with those. There's a lot of, you know, costs that go along with that, that um, chronic injury. Yeah. And so if you want to compare, as I am, falls to the coronavirus, you'll see that, you know, one is clearly um, seen by everybody on the planet as a crisis. The other one is seen as a non-issue. Yeah. It, it, it's as if it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And it's just psych psychologically speaking, it, it's, kind of funny to imagine that people can disconnect so easily, just compartmentalize it. When you talk, when, when people say to me, so Russ, what do you do? And I say, well, I prevent slips, trips, and falls. And they'll look at me and they'll say, really? You mean like people falling down? I'm like, yeah, that's a, a big problem. It's a chronic problem. Really? Yeah, really. It really is. I mean, people get hurt. I mean, probably yeah. somebody you know has <clears throat> fallen, been injured, maybe died. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, oh yeah, my mom, she was, yeah. you know, or my grandma. Everybody's got a story. They'll understand that story, it's, yeah. it, it happens, but they look at it as, you know, it's not even a legitimate subject. Like, huh? No, I like, know. I think you, the perception you issue. You don't really do that, do you? Yeah. The perception issue, we've got to, you know, figure out how to tackle it because I think, you know, if you Google slip accident, you still get, you know, comedic videos rather than statistics and people um, because as you say, because there are so, so many of these accidents that actually don't result in anybody getting hurt seriously at all, or, or even, you know, somebody can slip, but stop themselves from actually falling. And that, that really is, you know, just as bad uh, as somebody slipping and hurting themselves uh, seriously, because actually it's just luck really as to whether they stop themselves or fall and have a, have a big uh, injury. Um, because it's just so prevalent, I think people kind of have just started accepting it, um, and we've got to try and shake people out of that somehow. Well, and my background is in mathematics. I was a math major in college, and so um, the old saying that figures lie, and liars figure, is is true. You can statistically make anything to be as big or small as you would like, but if we just examine the data, fatalities, injuries, costs, meaning in dollars or pounds. Yeah. Um, lawsuits, claims, how, however, however you want to measure or scale the problem. Slips, trips, and falls is and has been a crisis for, for decades, long before me. And, and part of the reason is because of gravity. As I like to say, as long as there's gravity, people will fall. Yeah. And, and because of that, people have just become accustomed to falling. I mean, from the time we took our first steps. We all have personal experience with falling. Um, but, you know, when you're young, you fall and you bounce and you get up and you're embarrassed and you leave. Yeah. Uh, when you're my age, you fall, you hopefully can get up, um, didn't break anything. It's going to take some days off of work for sure. Um, and you hope by the grace of God, there's no yeah. long lasting injury. When you're 70, 80, you fall and you break and you die. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, statistically, uh, most of those people that will suffer a serious uh, hip injury uh, will either require uh, long-term uh, treatment, um, whether it be in a hospital or in a nursing home, or for those who go through uh, a surgical process, a third within six months will, will die. Yeah. And, and so it's a different perspective. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to throw something else at you, Chris, that 
you may find interesting or you may find offensive. So let me warn you up front. Uh, most Western countries tend to throw away our elderly. We, we really don't care about old people. Um, and if you ask the average British citizen or U.S. citizen, would you, want, would you rather spend $100 billion on keeping old people around longer, meaning preventing falls, preventing accidental death for the elderly? Or would you spend that $100 billion on repaving highways? Hmm. You're going you're gonna to find most people are going to go with the highway. Yeah. Um, it, it, I say that not to be callous, but when we examine the, the population that is suffering the most, the elderly, we tend to kind of discount it. And in fact, back to our coronavirus hmm. example, we see even that's the case with nursing homes, yeah. where so many people that are dying from coronavirus are the sick, the infirm, and, and the elderly. And although it's tragic, it doesn't get the headlines. No. For example, Tom Hanks got the coronavirus a couple of weeks ago, him and his wife. And that's all I've been seeing on, on the news is mm. the Tom Hanks update. And I'm, I'm a big Tom Hanks fan, but yeah. he's a celebrity. Mm -hmm. I don't see Martha McGillicuddy, <laughs> her death at the nursing home, you know, the other day on the news. Mm. In fact, they've never named any of the people that have died, yeah. no. um, the elderly specifically. So again, it's because, well, you know, look, Chris, they're, they're old people yeah. and old people die. Yeah, and I, um, it's interesting as well because I think there's something that I've been talking about quite a lot and <clears throat> I've not really heard many other people talk about in the kind of wider risk and safety community, but there's, the, there's this kind of demographic wave as well of all of these types of slip falls, but also manual handling and various other injuries because of the baby boomer generation um, getting older right. and getting into that age where actually these accidents are going to be more harmful to them. But also, and I, I guess you're seeing that in the States as well, but certainly here we're seeing it, people are, um, people are either, those, those baby boomers tend to be in one of two camps. They tend to either be pretty wealthy, in which case they're out going to gyms and supermarkets and shopping. And so they're out and about doing stuff and therefore their exposure to risk is higher. Or right. they tend to be people that are working later in life. And so they've got that kind of workplace risk exposure. So I kind of see that over the next five, 10, 15 years, actually the, these accident rates and claims are just going to skyrocket even more because of, because of that population uh, shift. Exactly. And again, there's certain built-in prejudices that people have. And one of them outside of the, the Eastern uh, Asian um, uh, countries, which value age, um, most Western countries value youth, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's protecting children. It's all about the kids. And so if we flip the coronavirus fatality um, demographic over, so it wasn't older people dying, but younger people, I think there'd be a different perspective. Now, it's a crisis either way. Mm. But, um, you know, it's just the way we look at the problem as it affects people is oftentimes skewed towards who are the people that are most victimized. Another example is... Um, uh, is uh, people from a third world or mm -hmm. people who are, you know, in, in our country um, illegally. You know, they tend to be seen as, you know, second class, third class citizens. They, they don't seem to matter as much, yeah. okay, um, than, than naturalized citizens. We, we tend to say, well, you know, yeah, they're in the country illegally. Mm -hmm. Somehow that, you know, not that anybody would want harm done to them because right. we wouldn't, but it's a perspective, that certain lives are much more valuable than other lives. Okay. That's my point. And mm -hmm. with falls, the fatality issue, the death issue is really skewed yeah. almost entirely towards the elderly, you know, people over the age of 60, 65. And by the way, I turned 60 this year, so I qualify. And so when you get old, society tends to think, well, it's okay if an older person dies because old people die. It's when younger people what are perceived as more productive people mm -hmm. uh, are experiencing, you know, the problem in a way that may lead to a, a fatality mm -hmm. um, that the image changes, the perspective yeah. changes. So you can't, you know, you can't make, you can't make, uh, you can't make that any different. And at least that's in the U S I don't know, maybe it's different in, in, in Europe. Um, I, I think I um, it's been interesting following um, Italy and Spain because <clears throat> the, um, 
the Mediterranean culture is is more um, certainly more than the sort of Anglo-Saxon culture in the UK it is more centered around the family and I think that um, you know so a high hypo hypothesis is that you know <clears throat> the fact that the the death rates have been so much higher there is because maybe family units are a bit closer and there is a bit more um you know uh, younger kids seeing their grandparents more frequently and that's been transmitting the disease and stuff i mean uh, you know that, that could be pie in the sky but that, that that's kind of the sense that i've had well that's a good point remember what the fear is the fear is that the younger people millennials who are just getting back from spring break are going to infect their grandparents, mm. right? Isn't that the threat? It's, well, young people are going to get it, but that's okay. I mean, they're cool. They can get over it, right? Yeah. They're not going to, they're not going to die. Demographically speaking, at least it was thought that most young people are, I don't want to say immune, but they're bold. Yeah. You know, they can get the coronavirus, they'll get sick and they're, they're done. You just don't want to bring it home to grandma because it'll kill her, right? That that's, that's the cross migration, if you will, pollinate, pollination of the problem. It's contagious. And so you don't want the older people getting infected by the younger people. And that's exactly mm. true. That is yeah. what's happening. Mm. Um, in the world of slips and falls, uh, gravity shows no mercy no. to anybody. <laughs> We're all susceptible to yeah. a fall. Again, when you're younger, you, you bounce. Right? Exactly. When you're older, yeah. you bring. Yeah. And <laughs> um, how much money do you want to spend as a country? And, and with your products, mm. how much money do you want to spend to protect and keep old people alive longer. Yeah. Hmm. And I know that sounds really harsh, and I certainly don't share that view, but it is a common view. It's a hmm. view of, you know, why would we spend that kind of money when, you know, A, my insurance company is paying for it, or, you know, it's, you know, you work, say you work for a mom and pop company where everybody, you know, like a, in a, a restaurant, everybody in the restaurant's part of the family, yeah. you know, your son, your cousins, your brother, your wife, Everybody's working in the restaurant. So if one of the family members gets hurt, which you don't want them to get hurt, you never have to worry about them suing you. you know, right. Your brother's not going to sue you. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Tony's back hurt for three days. He came back. He's okay. Hmm. That's the view. Yeah. Unless Tony fell in such a way that became seriously injured, like broke a bone, then it's, then it's not okay. Yeah. All right. But it's all about um, how we view the problem, how hmm. we want to approach the problem. And, and, and Chris, we live in a world of risk, as I, as I preach to, to many people. We live in a, in a world of risk. Just getting up in the morning, getting dressed, getting in your car, there's a risk, just driving. Um, we are surrounded by bacteria and fungus and viruses and yeah. everywhere. So we live, in a, we li live in a world of risk. And if you want to sit around worrying about all the things that can go wrong, it'll drive you crazy and you'll become yeah. paranoid. So you don't. But you do look at the legitimate risk and certainly that that is preventable hmm. and address it. Yeah. That's where resources should go. And falls, is, falls, falls right into that uh, category yeah, of a preventable absolutely. injury. I mean, it's the most preventable. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've seen, I mean, I've, I've been shocked sometimes when I've seen reports from like health and safety companies um, sharing data saying i don't know in leisure centers for example um uh 95 percent of accidents were unavoidable and i'm just thinking to myself well that that i know that's not true because i know that over a third of of uh, claims in leisure centers are down to people slipping and another nearly 10 percent are tripping so they're and, and none of those accidents are unavoidable you know they're all they all should be avoidable so again it's a perception well, one thing isn't it one thing we, I don't do, and I preach, is to use the word accident. Um, generally speaking, the word accident means something that was uh, non -predict unpredictable and not preventable. Hmm. You know, getting hit by a you know, bolt of lightning on a clear sunny day. You know, one dark cloud, boom, you get hit by lightning and it kills you. That, that's, that's, a, that's probably the epitome of an accident. There's just nothing you could have done. You couldn't predict it. You couldn't have prevented it. And there are many types of accidents. Car, many car crashes are indeed accidents. Somebody gets hit by a car and there's nothing they could have done. But in the world of slips and falls, most of these injuries and fatalities are not accidents. Uh, they are predictable and they are preventable. Um, you go into any national retailer, and um, talk about the problem. They say, yeah, they have a long history of getting hit by lightning, so to speak. So what do you do about it? You know, you, you know it's predictable. What are you doing to prevent them? And they choose to do nothing. So they're not accidents. We, I like to recommend that we refer, refer to them as incidents. Yeah, that's an interesting incidents. way of putting it, actually. Because the minute, you, 
You've got something there. Yeah, the reason I say that is when you use the word accident, it, it connotes a certain meaning to people that, it, well, there's nothing you could have done. I mean, yeah. it was just an accident. Mm. So when we talk about slip and fall accidents, it softens, if you will. The language softens the message. Yeah. Um, and people kind of get lulled into thinking, well, they're just an accident. I mean, what can you do about it? But if you refer to them as incidents um, or events, a slip and fall event, um, mm. you know, words have meaning. Yeah. Um, words have yeah. meaning. So I, I, I prefer rarely to use the term accident when we're speaking about falls because most are predictable and certainly are preventable and therefore they are truly not accidents. They're, mm. uh, they're, they're avoidable. Yeah. Yeah, that's very, a very, very interesting point. And I, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there, actually. I think that's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go away and think about how to try and get that point across a bit more myself, because it, it makes perfect sense. You're right, you know, <clears throat> talking about an accident, oh, well, what could we do? But actually, these, these, these things, these incidents shouldn't be happening. You know, you sh there are things you can do that, right. that are proven to, uh, to, to reduce the risk. It and I'm fortunate in much of my work to have surveillance videos of real people really falling, some of which die as a result of their falls. And I'll um, oftentimes use these videos in a presentation and I'll show people getting hurt. And, and, you, and you watch the audience just wince. Yeah. Ooh, oh, oh. You know, all of a sudden, they, oh, man, they, when, when you show a legitimate fall yeah. and somebody really getting hurt, they wince. And I'll always close by saying, well, Oh, well, well, I guess they should just watch where they're walking. Mm. And what happens, the audience gets the sarcasm. You know, it's easy to say, well, why don't you just watch where you're walking or be more careful? Mm. You know, what were you thinking about? Were you preoccupied? We like to blame the victim. People that get hurt as a result of fall oftentimes. Shoes are, as well. I, I mean, I see. Are victimized in more than just one way. Yeah. All the time, it's kind of like, oh, well. This lady had high, he high heels on. That was stupid, wasn't it? Well, it's like, well, hold on. There's no law saying you can't wear high heels in a, in a supermarket. I mean, if people well, are going to wear high so heels. so what? Yeah. So what? So she was wearing high heels. So what? But what does that mean? Somehow she deserved it? It was her fault? No, it, the point is, and by the way, she was able to walk perfectly fine with those high heels. Exactly, yeah. Up until she fell. Yeah. So it, was a, it wasn't like she you know, was falling constantly. No. Um, but it's, it's a matter of using... Um, the language in a way to speak to the problem in a way that doesn't um, doesn't soften it because it's um, it's an important subject and I as many who know me Chris uh, consider me a bit of a uh, troublemaker I think that was the problem. <laughs> and, and I'm not afraid to stir the pot you know we're, we're going to talk about the problem we're going I'm going to show you people getting hurt and you know what that could be your mom that could be your grandmother that could be yeah. you let's make it personal. Mm. You know, it's, it's easy to say, well, watch where you're walking. Yeah. Well, we've all fallen and we've all tripped on buckled floor mats and slippery floors and on and on and on. And, and, it's, and it's not because we weren't watching where we're walking. We were watching where we were going. And, um, and, 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 and unbeknownst to us, we experienced a, a hazardous condition that we were unaware of and we, got, and we were harmed by it. Yeah. And it's not like a business owner wanted us to get hurt. So that's the flip side. It's not like, well, they're, you yeah. know, they, they, they meant for us to get hurt. No, they didn't. There's this, this ground, this common ground in the middle between blaming one side or the other. And that's, that's where prevention lives in that middle ground. What can everybody do to prevent being injured? And you, you brought up high heels. Yeah. I mentioned a moment ago, flip flop. Um, I remember having a case where I was representing a plaintiff who went into a grocery store, slipped and fell, got hurt. She was wearing flip-flops and the floor was wet. And um, the defense attorney kept, during my deposition, kept saying, well, Mr. Kenzier, you wrote a book called Falls Aren't Funny. In your book, you talk a lot about footwear and you specifically talk about flip-flops. In fact, you say that flip-flops are the most dangerous type of shoe that a person could wear. And that's true. It is the most dangerous shoe type of shoe, if you want to call a sandal, a shoe yeah. um, that people can wear. And they'll say, well, so you identify that flip-flops are very dangerous. So it really was her fault. I mean, she was wearing flip-flops and that's what caused her, her fall. And I'll say, well, of course that's, that's in part true. Her choice of footwear was um, played a, a role in her fall. Not necessarily it was her fault, but let's be clear. 
she bought the flip-flops from you, yeah. the retailer, all right? You sold her those flip-flops, mm -hmm. those dangerous shoes. And I don't remember any warning tag being right. put on those dangerous shoes, cautioning her to how dangerous those flip-flops yeah. were. So are you saying that you sold her da a dangerous product and did not notify her? And it's amazing when you kind of look at the attorney on the other side and how quickly they mm. reposition I, I themselves. Mm. It's a matter of flip-flops are commonly worn. People wear them all the time. Here in Texas in the summer, I mean, it's probably the, the official state, you know, footwear of Texas, Florida, and Hawaii. Yeah. Um, people are going to wear them. And most people that wear flip-flops are not falling, but many people that wear flip-flops mm. do slip and fall. I'm sure that's true around the world. Do you yeah. blame them? Do you blame the manufacturers of flip-flops? And the answer is label. Let people know, all right? It, it's like cigarettes. If you mm -hmm. want to smoke cigarettes here in the States, there's a little warning sticker on the side of the packet same of yeah, cigarettes. Same, yeah. It says, caution. You know, this can cause lung cancer. Mm -hmm. All right, if you want to smoke, I guess you have the right to go out and smoke. You have, you have that right. And, and it's not like if you smoke, you will automatically get lung cancer. Many right. people that get lung cancer were never smokers. And yeah. many people that smoke their whole life never get lung cancer. But there's a correlation. I understand that. Mm -hmm. Same is true for falls. Footwear, there's a correlation. Yeah. Floors, a direct correlation. There's a lot of things that can be done mm -hmm. as far as public awareness. But in the world of falls, 75 people died yesterday, Chris. Nobody knows it. No. Nobody cares. Nobody. Yeah. It's it's a non-issue. Mm. It's a non-issue. Um, yeah. And until that perception changes, um, my friend, we are not going to see any big movement in our industry because if it's not perceived by the average person as a crisis, it'll never mm. be uh, addressed as a crisis. Yeah. Yeah. If it's paid for by the insurance industry, people just absorb the cost, pass it along to the consumer, and everything is fine. I mean, there there comes a point where everything won't be fine. Yeah. But in the 30 plus years I've been in this industry, uh, nothing has really changed. In, in not that, there yet. Uh, not there yet. Yeah. yeah. Not there yet. No, no, we're not. But we'll keep up the good fights. You, you over well, there. Well, it you? is. And it's one, that, it's one that gave me all this gray hair. Uh, <laughs> and it's a valuable fight. You know, I, 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 I like to think that uh, what you do and what I do and, and others in our industry do does make a difference. And um, uh, you'll never know the people whose lives you you've changed. You yeah, know? well, that's it. You, I don't know if you've ever read the book, yeah. I don't know if you've ever read the book, Chris, the five people you meet in heaven, by Malcolm Gladwell, and it's a it's a, it's a very good book. It's a very short book. It's a bestseller across the world, and it just talks about the people you meet in heaven when you die. And it's people whose lives you changed, and mm. you never knew it. People yeah. that were strangers to you, mm. and you made a big impact in their life, and and you never knew it, and they didn't know you. And yeah. that's kind of what we do. The young unsung uh, heroes of slip and fall prevention absolutely um kind of like we're in a category of nurses and doctors and firemen yeah. you know policemen people who go out and help others i mean like a fireman someone that's mm -hmm. going to run it rush into your house in the middle of the night and rescue your dog <laughs> and yeah. your children and, and 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 risk their own life and, and they don't even know you they don't yeah. even know you uh, and it's not like they're making a lot of money it's not like they're no. the highest paid people of our society no, no. Um, but it's that type of person that i find myself attracted to mm. yeah well that's a nice positive uh, message on which to to finish um so thank you very much for your time and your insights uh, on this uh, conversation if people want to um get in touch with you or follow what you're doing or find out more about the nfsi do you want to give us some links and uh, twitter handles and whatever? yeah it's um yeah, most of what we do is actually free um, or very, very low cost. They can join. Uh, there are memberships uh, available uh, at various categories. Um, and uh, by visiting our website, which is nfsi.org, that's Nancy Frank Sam Indigo, dot O-R-G. Um, they can uh, visit the site and see uh, a wide range of information. You can... Um, uh, see the products that have been certified by the NFSI, our train classes, of course, all the national standards uh, that we publish uh, here in North America. NFSI is the uh, leading publisher of uh, nationally adopted consensus standards in uh, North America. And, and by the way, it's expanding. We found that many of our uh, standards, specifically the DCOF standard, B101.3, 
is the, becoming a very popular standard throughout Europe um, okay. for testing of, of floors. Yeah. And so uh, visit our website. Um, I also have, as you know, my own podcast, which is yeah. Slip and Fall Guy. Slip and Fall Guy, uh, yeah. Just very, good, very good listening. Yeah, yeah. If you uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> uh, we uh, were available on uh, the Apple and Google podcasts, and we just completed up um, series one a few months ago, and we'll be putting series two uh, podcasts out uh, this summer. So we'd encourage folks if they want to hear more about what our message is, my message is, uh, visit the website and uh, go to the podcast. And a couple of books as well, is that right? Three, yeah. Three books. Um, yeah. The, the most recent is called Floored Real Life Stories from a Slip and Fall Expert Witness. Good title. It's, Good title. It's just that. It's 55 chapters. Every chapter is a story about a person who slipped and fell and were tripped and fell and uh, filed a lawsuit. What was the lawsuit about and how did it end? And it's intriguing. A lot of people like hearing my stories mm -hmm. about lawsuits. I've worked on over 800, I guess, approaching 900 uh, slip, trip, and fall lawsuits throughout yeah. all of the U.S. And the stories are very diverse. I represent right. both plaintiffs and defendants. So you get both sides of the story, uh, in yeah. fairness. Uh, my second book was called Falls Aren't Funny. And it's a more um, intense book in terms of data and causation, the problem of slips and falls, the impact, financial and otherwise. Um, the first book was called uh, slip and fall prevention made easy. And it was yeah. a handbook. It's a book that was used for, uh, by small companies to get a handle on preventing uh, accidental falls for their business. So yes, uh, there's three books. And I guess they're on Amazon and the usual, all the usual places. They are, they are all on. I think I know that the last two are in the, the first book, slip and fall prevention made easy, which is published in the 1990s is, uh, is available on their website. Great. So lots of yeah, plenty of content there to uh, to follow on Russ's end. So Russ Kenzior, thank you very much for joining us today on the Slip Safety Show. You're welcome. Thank you, Chris. Cheers. Bye bye.